So it's been two weeks. Uh, in chapter one, it was like the drama and the trauma. Talk about PTSD, you know, and I could see a lot of fear. I was reading as like a lot of fear they must have been felt. Imagine from the time they left Egypt, they had the nine plagues, you know, those nine plagues. We don't have to go through all of them, but the firstborns probably would have been enough to scare me. And then when they went through the Red Sea on dry ground, the Lord closed up all the Egyptians. Imagine seeing all their bodies floating down the ocean. That's like a traumatizing thing, too. And then uh, they didn't want to. Uh, let me look at my notes here. Even with the golden calf, when Moses came down, you know, that was traumatizing. Like, before that, the leaders of the 12 tribes were going to be priests. After that, only the Levites could be priests. So imagine all, a lot of feelings and things they went through just because of that. And then the Ten Commandments itself, the law written by God's finger, you know. Imagine being there for that. that that's another trauma. And then where we left off in chapter 1, they were told to go in, and they didn't want to go in. So the Lord said, okay, turn around and go in the opposite direction. Then they wanted to go in. Huh? They all picked up their swords and said, are we ready? We're going in. And then, No, you're not going in. Yeah, we're going in. Imagine how the Lord is watching them do that. And Moses was telling them, no, that the Lord's not with you. So the Lord wasn't with them, and they were defeated. So yeah, I just wanted to look back at what they went through, the Ten Commandments. And there's so much more things that they probably went through that, imagine wearing the same clothes for 40 years, same slippers, same shirt, eh? you got to get the pattern on that clothing, but God was with them. He took care of them, provided the clothing. So chapter, chapter, Chapter 2, verse 1. The title of this is Remembering Israel's Wanderings. And we got to remember Deuteronomy is like the last 37 days before Moses is going to pass away. So he's like really urging them to just do it. Just listen. Just follow. Just obey. He's, throughout this chapter, we're going to hear him say, come on, go and do it. And then, uh, so it's like five sermons that he's going to give them in a matter of 37 days want to point that out so chapter 2 verse 1 then we turned around and headed back across the wilderness towards the Red Sea just as the Lord instructed me and we wandered around in the region of Mount Seir for a long time uh, I was told it was like maybe a year a long time and then you see how it, then at last the Lord said to me you have been wandering around in this hill country long enough. So he felt their pains. He knew. The Lord knows how much we can handle. You know, even with our trials today. He won't let us break. He'll never try us, tempt us, or test us beyond what we can handle. He knows us. And there's something about that breaking point that we all go through. We're all different. Everyone has the different buttons, the different breaking points. But the Lord knows it, the breaking point. And we're all different. And I wanted to uh, point out in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. They say when we turn these pages, they sound like leaves. I don't hear the leaves. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. The temptation in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. And yes, I have seen it many times in my life. He actually, the day I received the Holy Spirit, I remember him showing me he like fast forward and rewind my life in front of me and I could see the times where he was with me, where I could have been hurt or I could have been 
worse. And he showed me how he was there, and I had that way out. And he's so awesome. So like I said, uh, that was an example. He is never late nor early, but on God's timing. And there's always a way out so we can endure it. He will teach us. And we all learn through that. It's like with my son. I trust he knows the Lord. So he knows. But you got to let him, let the Lord bend him and shape him and mold him a little bit more. And he'll be back. And then there's always, there's always a way out so we can endure it. I think it was George Mueller who said, the only way to have great faith is to endure great trials. And through Calvary, I've also often heard how we're either in our way into a trial or on our way out of a trial. Sometimes we get yanked back into a trial more than once. So the more we, like I said, the more we read this book, the more powerful we can be when we come to those trials. Okay, verse 4. Give these orders. Oh. At last. So you have been wandering around this hill country long enough, the Lord said. Turn to the north. North means up to, by the way, from where they are. So that's always good to go up. Verse 4. Give these orders to the people. You will pass through the countries of your relatives, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir. The Edomites... You'll feel threatened, so be careful. Do not bother them, for I have given them all the hill country around Mount Seir as their property, and I will not give you even one square foot of their land. I want to point out something here. The Edomites were afraid, and that is why they were to be. The Lord actually told them why and how. He's like, that's your relatives, so they're going to be afraid. But he, doesn't, he said walk lightly because he doesn't want you to have conflict with them because that land is not going to be yours. Imagine if they fought, you would take over their land. So the Lord said be careful. Do not threaten. Verse 6, if you need food or water to drink, pay them for it. For the Lord your God has blessed you. This is important. Remember that. In everything you have done, he has watched your every step through this great wilderness during these 40 years. The Lord your God has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. Remember how in the early times they had fire by night, cloud by day, manna was preserved? But if you see here, now the Lord, if you need food or water, pay them. So they had to learn. They had to grow up in this, this portion here. This Moses is pointing out. In, in Numbers, we didn't see that, but here they're showing it. So... The Lord has blessed the Israelites with money to buy food and water. And what about, like I was saying earlier, what about their clothing, clothing and slippers? So they had to grow up and learn how to provide for themselves. So they're learning. So back to verse 8. So we passed by the territories of our relatives, the descendants of Esau, who lived in Seir. We avoided the road through Ar, Arba, Arba valley that comes up from Elath and Ezron Gerber. Then as we turned north along the desert route through Moab, the Lord warned us again, do not bother the Moabites, the descendants of Lot, or start a war with them. I have given them Ar as their property, and I will, I will not give you any of their land. See here, we see again, the Lord warns them. And then I wanted to point out, um, you guys remember Esau? He gave up his birthright. And he wasn't really a, a believer in Jesus. And look how the Lord still provided for him, and he promised them, even with Lot. And these promises were a long time ago, and God still doesn't forget. God always remembers. I just wanted to point that out. God keeps his word. The Lord went before them and gave them the lands as well as Esau. Yeah. So God keeps his word. Verse 10. A race of giants called the Eomites, Emites, and once lived in the area of Ar. 
They were as strong and numerous and tall as the Anarchy, another race of giants. Both the Emites and Anakites, also known as Raphites, Termites, and this one is easy. The Moabites called them Emites. In earlier times, the Horites lived in Seir, but they were driven out and displaced by the descendants of Esau, just as Israel drove out the people of Canaan. See here, Moses is trying to show how before them, God helped use, the, use Esau and Lot to drive out the giants before them. So imagine how he, that was why they were so afraid in the first chapter was because of the giants. But look, God helped them get rid of their giants. So God can help them get rid of the giants. So the people of Canaan, when the Lord gave Israel their land, same thing. Verse 13, Moses continued. Moses continued, then the Lord said to us, get moving, see, Moses getting all excited again, get moving, the zero brook. So we crossed the brook. 38 years passed now. The time we first left Kadesh Barnum until we finally crossed the zero brook. By then, all the men old enough to fight in the battle had died in the wilderness, as the Lord has vowed would happen. The Lord struck them down until they had all been eliminated from the community. When all the men of fighting age had died, the Lord said to me, today you will cross the border of Moab at Ar and enter the land of the Ammonites, the descendants of Lot, but do not bother them or start a war with them. I have given the land of Ammon to them as their property and I will not give you any of their land. That area was once considered the land of the Raphites. Amorites called them Zamzumines. I really like that name, Zamzumines. They imagine like a bunch of, I wanted to come and make my face with a Z and look like a warrior, the Zamzumines. Well, they were also as strong and numerous and tall as the Anakis. But the Lord destroyed them so the Amorites could occupy their land. So the same way, the Lord helped them destroy them. He had done the same for the descendants of Esau, who lived in Seir. For he destroyed the Horites so they could settle there in their place. The descendants of Esau lived there till, till to this day. A similar thing happened when the Kaftorites from Crete invaded the, and destroyed the Avites who had lived in the villages in the area of Gaza. So I wanted to point out here, and sometimes God will use someone else to fight our battle, to fight our giants. Saul, like you guys remember the story of Goliath, David and Goliath, Saul and all his army were listening to Goliath for like 40 days and 40 nights. And it only took David one time to hear him, and he stepped up. Um, I think I referenced that. If you guys want to turn there, you can, or I'll just read uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 17, 1 to 3. First Samuel. 17, 1 to 3. I'll read it. The Philistines now mustered their armies for battle and camped between Sokoin, Sokoin Judah, and Azka at Ephstam, Ephstamim. Saul, countered by, uh, countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah, so the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valleys between them. So um, like imagine we're on one side, Philistines on one side. But what I'm seeing here is where the Philistines was, was their land. This is our, they should have been saying, this is our land. You guys are on our land. And none of them could see that. And David, as a young boy, saw that. 
This guy is blas talking blasphemy. He heard one time, and his brothers tell him, "Go home, you little kid," you know. And he was like, "No, this giant is defying our people, our God, and he's on our land. Let me go get him." He was telling King Saul, "Let me go get him." And they were laughing like, "He'll spit you out." He's like, "No, I fought a bear. No, I fought a lion." So I mean, I could imagine. Saul said, "Oh yeah, here, go fight him. Take my armor." <laughs> Like 200 pound armor. They, they, no, they said, no, I just need my rocks, my sling, and we'll fight them. So David, David understood this. I just wanted to point that out. So what we see here is if God gives you land and he tells you go, you got to take it. You can't give it up to someone else. So Deuteronomy verse 24 get back to it. So again, Moses continued. Then the Lord said, now get moving. Cross the Aaron Gorge. Look, I will hand over to you Shihon, the Amorite king, and Heshbon, and I will give you his land. Attack him and begin to occupy his land. See the difference here? In the last couple, it was like, they're saying, don't touch them, don't bother them. Now he's saying, attack them, attack them. So that's the difference I saw here. Beginning today, I will make people throughout the earth, throughout, throughout the earth, terrified because of you. See, the Lord made them terrified. And when they hear reports about you, they will tremble with dread and fear. Remember this. I'm going to put that in your pocket. I'm going to close about this fear. I'm going to talk about this fear again. I don't want to stop now. So like I said right now, the Lord is with them. He's telling them to fight. Go fight. So victory over Sion and Heshbon. Verse 26. Uh, Moses continued from the wilderness of Kidmah. I sent ambassadors to King Sion of Heshbon with this proposal of peace. Let us travel through your land. We will stay on the main road and won't turn off into the fields of either side. Sell us food to eat and water to drink, and we will pay for it. All we want is permission to pass through your land. The descendants of Esau, who lived in Seir, allowed us to go through their country. And so did the Moabites, who lived in Ar. Let us pass through until we cross the Jordan into the land the Lord our God is giving us. But, but King Shion of Hesh, Heshbon refused to, to allow us to pass through because the Lord your God made Shion stubborn and defiant so, he could, he, so that he could help you defeat him as he, will, he, has, known, he has now done. I was comparing this to, remember when they left Egypt, Pharaoh, the Lord hardened his heart so that he would follow. He put a hook in his mouth and they dragged him behind, made him go into the Red Sea. So the whole world heard this story after. That spread through the world and terrified. Well, now people are terrified again and the Lord's going to use him again. It says right here, and defiant so he could help you defeat him as he has now done then the Lord said to me look I have begun to hand King Sion and his land over to you begin now to conquer and occupy his land then King Sion declared war on us and mobilized his forces at Jahaz but the Lord our God handed him over to us and we crushed him his sons and all his people. We conquered all his towns, completely destroyed everyone. Men, women, and children. Not a single person was spared. We took all the livestock and plunder for ourselves, along with anything of value from the towns we ransacked. The Lord our God also helped us conquer Aror on the edge of the Iron Gorge. And the town in George 
and the whole area as far as Gilead. No town had walls too strong for us. However, we avoided the land of Ammon, Ammonites all along the German Brook River and the towns in the hill country, all the places the Lord God had commanded us to leave alone. So they were nice, they were obedient here. I want to point out, uh, I was talking about it earlier, don't give away what God has given you. And just because he gives it to you doesn't mean it will be easy. A lot of us, when we began Christian, we thought, oh, I remember telling my wife, don't worry, just trust in God. And she had to remind me, hey, just because you prayed and just because it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's going to have to pick up that cross. My mom would always say, pick up your cross. You know, you're going to have troubles. It's not going to be easy. So, like I said, just because he gives it to us doesn't mean it will be easy. As a Christian life, it's not, an, it's not a playground, but it's a battleground. And Matthew 13, I wanted to turn to Matthew 13, verse 3 to 9. I got to turn my leaves. Verse 3 to 9. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. This is how you're going to, uh, when you have crosses in life, this is kind of like an example for me. I, I, I don't know why it just came to me. He told men, Jesus told many stories in forms of parables, such as this one. He said, listen, as a farmer went out to plant some seed, as he scattered them across the field, some seeds fell on the footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil and underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the, sh the hot sun. And since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still, other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much and had planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And then if we go down to 19, verse 19 to 23. He's explaining, Jesus is so kind and loving that he's going to explain to us. I think even apostles had a hard time understanding his parable. The more you read this book, the more you will understand. That's what I've learned. So verse 19, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are or persecuted by believing God's persecuted by for believing God's word. Then the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out and the worries of this life and the the lure of wealth. A lot of us have problems with wealth. So no fruit is produced. Then the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much. So they were... I 
like I said, I just that that really connected me in that, that last portion right here in verse three. Uh, and I also wanted to talk about that fear. Remember, I told you guys put it in a pocket. The fear. They were filled with fear. And then I remember Pastor Russell saying, "Greater is He that is in us than whom is in the world." A lot of these times, this world make, makes us fear. This COVID thing made us made us all fear. Some, one day we had that missile alert made us fear. But God didn't teach us fear. And then uh, faith comes. With faith come over faith overcomes fear. I wanted to share that. I last minute I pulled that one out of Romans ten verse seventeen. You guys all know that one, but I wanted to read it again. Verse seventeen, Romans ten. So faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. And that is so true. The more I read in this book, the less fear. I actually wrote that down in my notes as the next portion. So in closing, so the more we read our Bibles, the more faith we will have. And the less we read our Bibles, the more fear we will have. So let's all go home and read our Bible. <laughs> and wake up in the morning, read our Bibles. Well, like me and Hank, we were spending our time in the conference looking at new books to read and those daily devotionals. And my wife goes, we already have one. I go, hey. Now we have two. So we can read two. And, and those devotionals in the morning strengthen us for when we go to work. I read one yesterday, and when I went to work, it was like ammunition in my pocket. Someone talked to me about the very thing I just read, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I got an answer for you. So that's all I have for tonight, Lord. Uh, and let's pray again. I thank you guys for giving me this opportunity. I just want to take a deep breath. Thank you, Lord, for that deep breath. And for all the things that we just take for granted. How you go ahead of us, Lord, and prepare. And how we foolishly fear sometimes. When, yes, all we do is have to do is just trust in you. And just go out there and do it. And I ask that you continue to prepare us, Lord, for the battles ahead. And oh, I remember how my mom used to point it out to me. The devil is there looking. But we have you, Lord. And you are in front of us, behind us, on the side of us. Help us to put on that armor of God every day, Lord. Just, just thank you. I remember always saying, if you're with us, who can be against us? Just like David. Help us to be more like David. Not be afraid to just step out and battle in your name, Lord, for you. Help us to stand in the gaps and help others. And like I said, I just thank you for this place that we can come. I know I asked earlier to fill us afresh. Come and fill us again, Lord, as we leave. Be with us on our way home. Fill us afresh with that spirit. And just... Be with us through this work week and help us prepare for Sunday. Just sharpen each other as we go. I just thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.